Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are here for um, a webinar on the topic of building a better stock. It all starts with team alignment. I am Kayla Williams, the VP of GRC and acting CISO at Devo. And I would like to introduce you to our panel today. First, we have uh, Juliana. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, yes, uh, my name is Juliana. Uh, I've been in security for probably like seven years now and uh, primarily an incident response team. So looking forward to our discussion today on SOC misalignment. Great, thank you. And next we have Carrick. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm the CISO for Avnet, the biggest company nobody's ever heard about. Uh, new here, previously came from enterprise at H&R Block and government with the Department of Agriculture. Great. Thank you for being here today. And uh, Gunter. Hi, everyone. I'm Gunter Ullman, uh, Chief Security Officer here at Devo, running our research team, security strategy and product. Uh, feeling new to Devo, uh, previously Chief Security Officer for Microsoft's uh, Cloud and AI groups. Great. Thank you so much for being here with us today, everybody. Um, just a few housekeeping items for your awareness. Um, if you look at um, the bottom of your screen, you should have um, multiple tools that you can use. There is um, a Q&A box. If you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to put them in here. If we have an opportunity to address them relatively quickly through the, um, through the webinar, we will do that. If they require a bit more of an answer, we will hold them off until the end, or if we run out of time, we can um, arrange to have them answered via email for you. Um, also, if there's something that's a little bit too big, please feel free to move them around, to close it, minimize it, whatever makes the uh, viewing experience better for you. Okay, so moving on right into our first slide here. Great, thank you. Um, for the third consecutive year, uh, Devo has partnered with the Ponemon Institute to produce a SOC performance report. Um, so this year's survey, participants included over a thousand global cybersecurity professionals across all levels of the, of the SOC. And what's really interesting about this year's report is that we actually looked at um, the misalignment between these groups. And that's really where we wanted to focus um, this webinar session on. And the key findings that we've had are, you know, the continuing gap between high and low performing SOCs, the ongoing pain driving SOC analysts to consider quitting their jobs, as I'm sure many of you have experienced before, um, and also the disconnect between SOC leaders, their leaders, and also staff, right? There's a big disconnect between what management thinks is going on and what is actually happening boots on ground. Um, so I would like to start there and just ask a couple questions of this panel. And again, if you audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in. Um, I'll start actually um, with uh, Carrig, please. When and where have you encountered misalignment in the socks that you have worked in? And maybe when might be better if you don't want to name any company names. I, th I think from the SOC side of the house, there's almost always misalignment, frankly. You know, when you look at the leadership roles, like some of us are in now, and you look at where you're trying to just, dis, you know, disseminate your resources, it's not necessarily an equal playing field, right? The what, what pulls the leadership team within a security organization is different than the priorities of, say, the incident responders. And I think that's, that's part of the key question here is who's talking to who and, and what are the priorities there? You know, when I built the SOC, uh, at each and block, for example, you know, we were really focused on creating a single pane of glass, on creating advanced analytics, on really creating a very mature program. But that only works for so long, right? Because once once you start to become competent, you're no longer the the shiny light bulb or, or the, the the shiny uh, widget for people to pay attention to. And so the focus changes, and then it becomes a, a constant battle for resources and 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 really priority organization yeah absolutely I can I can see how that um, could impact the different levels of the, the organization um, Juliana do you have any input here yeah um, I mean I think where I see a lot of misalignment is um, around like metrics sometimes um, like because you know leadership wants to see numbers right and they want stats and 
um, the squad wants logs and visibility and tuned rules. And I think that um, sometimes if there's not good communication about what the leadership needs to see in order to make strategic decisions, um, that, you know, they can run in circles in terms of like what they, you know, what the leadership's requirements are and how, um, you know, the squad can provide that. Um, I also think there's some misalignment on, you know, can be with roles and responsibilities, um, you know, the squad's an ops team, right? They're running operations and, you know, anything outside of that needs to be recognized as um, pulling them away from operations to improve whether it's um, content management or Intel. Um, so I think having um, dedicated resources in those areas helps to make sure that communications are well and that those things are getting done and um, can improve alignment too. Uh, so I one more thing I'll mention on alignment with that I've seen is um, middle management, I think, can help a ton, right? So they're the they're in the middle. And I think ha um, supporting and building a strong middle management can really help with the alignment between the two groups because they can communicate um, both ways and manage expectations both ways, which I think is key. Yeah, absolutely. And that raises a really good point. Um, that is one recommendation for of how we can address some of this misalignment and, and the the breakdown of communication between the, the different layers in the organization. Um, Gunter, do you have any um, you know experience um, around the the causes of this? Is is it really just because of, you know, the boots on ground are just doing something and there's no communication? Is it misconstrued? Is it, you know, kind of deer in the headlights when it comes to these things at the um, the management and executive level? Do you have any insight I, there? I think, yeah, so I, I think there are a few parts. So so one is um, that there's still, when I think about uh, internal SOC and SOC organizations, there, there's still a misalignment, uh, at, you know, it's stemming from, it's another cost center. Um, it's an evolution of the IT, which is already a cost center. And so, you know, outside of the, the IT and SOC teams, uh, you know, the businesses sort of look at it, you know, this is a costly thing uh, and uh, don't really understand some of the the activities that go on with inside the SOC. What they see are the outputs and the outputs tend to be, um, oh my gosh, uh, my business unit has not been uh, secure and I've been told that there are 101 things that I have to go do better, um, but I don't have resources and things. So I think, one aspect is you know, from the internal side, the misalignment of um, being perceived as that cost center uh, and hard to uh, for other parts of the business to sort of understand the the outputs and the requests that come from SOC, especially during the incidents, uh, in how they prioritize those responses. In other aspects, you know, so I've been lucky enough to build SOCs and deliver SOCs as managed services. Uh, in which case, the you know, the misalignment that I tend to, to see is uh, reading around the sort of the the level of outputs and how that uh, how that output is consumed by the end customer or IT team or soft you know, or customer soft team, and that misalignment really being about um, the level of detail uh, mm -hmm. in response and understanding of the of the customer's end environments. Uh, so I think those have already been some of the, the biggest missed alignments uh, and some missed opportunities for, for SOC teams and the businesses to sort of get ahead in the space. You know, you, you touched upon something that's very interesting me, to me, and this is a question that's open to anybody on the panel that would like to answer it. Um, is the SOC truly a cost center? we talk about the value that they add and the fact that many customers today that um, operate at you know, the, the higher level expect organizations to have security operation centers in place, network operation centers and security programs as, as a whole. Do you see maybe a, um, the, the perception of a SOC or a security team only being a cost center changing into something a bit more than just that? I mean, I'll, I'll take that. I think I'm being relatively new into cyber, uh, kind of like Juliana. I mean, I've eight years in this space. And when I first came in, it was very much like what you say. You know, this was more of an insurance policy viewpoint of we, we have to go spend this money, but it's like that shiny boat, right? It's, it's just endless bucket of expenditures and really no value seen other than the, the insurance aspect. 
I think that's really changing now, though, in, in many ways and, and becoming more of a competitive event uh, differentiator. The old mindset was really the point of a security org was to secure the business. But I think what we're seeing, especially in light of current events and the CISA guidance lately, things like that, is that really securing the organization now becomes the reason that your business can separate itself and differentiate itself from the competition. You know, when we're work, when you're working with other companies and other vendors, there's boilerplate of here's our expectations from our partners from a security perspective. So if as a company you don't have those expectations, you don't you don't you aren't able to answer even their basic boilerplate, why would they do business with you in this current environment? So security isn't this pigeonholed, I guess, uh, capability anymore. It's really a mandatory aspect of business dealings and. And I think we're seeing a lot more business leaders coming to the table now as a result of that. Any other comments? No, no I, I totally agree. Well said. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I might, might add one other little part, and that is I, I think you know, you're right that there has been this evolution. You know, I think there's still you know, that, that gap of uh, Oh my God! That uh, the SOC team have found more stuff, uh, and there's more of my workload as a business owner to to respond and to understand. But what we're also seeing is that the growth uh, and adoption of you know international standards, uh, you know, buying decisions you know, and partnering decisions, uh, which include the review of the you know the security and the protection uh, of, of of your vendors and of your of your partners in the space, and we've seen more and more. You know, um, agreements that uh, specifically call out the, uh, the you know, things such as 24, 24 by 7 monitoring uh, of security and wanting to see what those incident response plans. Uh, and so I think those are, you know, and, and, you know, and the policies and clients uh, for running a business are now encompassing more and more written down and maturity of, of those security processes. And so I, I think what we're also seeing is uh, finally, uh, those SOC teams in particular, the, the veterans in those SOC teams, evolving into business advisors uh, and working closer with those uh, business leaders uh, and even you know, some of their uh, middle management of those teams um, outside the security sphere and providing them with that, good, good, uh, that guidance on how to actually run and operate their business both securely but also to meet their customer requirements. So I think there's, there's that ongoing maturity there. Um, which is great <laughs> uh, and is moving the things uh, forward. But I, I think it also then you know, pulls back to something that we've seen is that uh, uh, finding those uh, you know, individuals from the side top teams that have those skills and capabilities to be able to support business outside of the, the deep technical um, you know, responder uh, with the side of the SOC team is becoming a little bit more difficult as well. Yes, and I think that translation from, you know, they say tech speak into business requirements and tying directly into business objectives will certainly help to decrease um, the misalignment aspect that we've seen uh, shine through in this survey that we've, we've conducted. Um, I do see there is a question. Um, so what are the key things that middle management need to communicate both ways? Metrics were mentioned. What are the most important metrics? And I believe Juliana, you were the one that had, um, had brought up this aspect, if you don't mind responding. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, metrics could mean like a slew of things. Um, and like I said, I think the most important thing is like, you know, as Gunter was hinting to you earlier, leadership's constantly going to bat for the team to get funding, um, to make sure that, uh, you know, it, we're not just viewed as a cost center and they need our, you know, they need help from below to get the right, to paint the picture, right? And I think, um, really having those discussions um, and spending the time talking about what the requirements are um, helps with going back and forth and constantly trying to provide the right metrics. Um, obviously, standard operational metrics will will need to be done for any op center, but um, you know, to help with those decisions, I think that having uh, longer discussions and workshops between the groups to understand what's needed to to drive um, change in the security organization uh, help. Did that answer the question? Yes, I think so. And just to add my own two cents here, I think also having, instead of just having the KPIs and the performance of the, of the SOC, 
Also understanding what the key risk indicators or KRIs are and understanding what the business feels is acceptable is a great way to start to formulate the metrics and the reporting that you want. That way, management knows, okay, I have a red, amber, green status, and I'm going to focus only on the ambers and reds because green means great. Everything is good, as we all say. Um, and, and being able to report in that aspect really helps to focus the conversation on the areas that need to be addressed. Um, and one of the other things that I think leads like really nicely into what's causing the misalignment is a lack of visibility into the attack surface. But could that also mean lack of visibility into what's actually occurring inside the SOC as well? Um, so 65% of our respondents have, have said that visibility is the top reason their SOC is ineffective. And 70% believe that it's the barrier to successfully operating their security operations center. Um, so, you know, um, Juliana, do you agree with this? Do you think um, that there are other factors that may be tying into um, what could really be behind such a high rating for visibility? Yeah, um, you know, I think that the definition of visibility um, is going to be different from each perspective. I think the leaders are going to think about it slightly differently than the SOC is going to be thinking about it. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of what I alluded to earlier is that, you know, leadership needs stats and metrics and, and to, to paint a picture and the staff wants um, that single pane of glass to be able to operate out of. Um, and I think that um, this, you know, this visibility in general is like very important. Um, but the staff, um, so one thing that I want to point out, sorry, is that with, um, with visibility, you have to remember that there's a ton of dependencies. So a SOC is going to need um, an asset database or a CMDB um, in order to be able to understand what the attack surface is. We don't know, we can't protect what we don't know exists out there. And without these strong dependencies that usually live in other functions within IT, um, you know, security can only get so far. So um, we can only take our visibility to a level where we know if people are out using credit cards and spinning up VMs in the cloud and nobody knows about it, then we can't protect it and we don't have that attack surface. Um, we don't even know what it is. Um, so I think that's a key point is to keep in mind is that you know your security team could be doing all that they can with what they're working with um, and that it really takes a collaboration with the IT teams to ensure full visibility. Um, so the, you know, I think the question should be asked like, is this only a security problem or is it bigger than that? Um, and help working through it. I think that um, this can help. And for, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> See if there's any questions. But does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Karik or Gunter? Yeah, I mean, if you don't mind, like, I actually love that comment, Juliana, because I think there's this concept that visibility is just logs. But it doesn't matter how good your logs are, if you find that adverse behavior and you really take extra time or struggle to find where it's coming from, what kind of device it is, where it's at within the organization, who owns it, the, the ownership aspect, and it's actually, to be honest, getting a lot more complicated as we transition to the cloud and work in more ephemeral environments to actually understand which organization or which part of the organization you even need to partner with to go research some of this stuff. But the other thing that I would point out that I think a lot of people miss is the visibility is an easy excuse, right? If you can't see it, you can't fight it. But when we go back to the core foundations, it's people, process, and technology. And I've been in a lot of organizations that have far more logs than they're using, right? They have, technically, the logs are there to provide visibility, but the processes, the use cases, the experience with those types of devices and what's normal and what's not normal and what, what would be considered a devi deviation from baseline, a lot of that additional stuff that goes into making that visibility worth having isn't done ahead of time. So the logs themselves, the CMDB by itself, like these auto, these CMDBs that claim to auto scan the environment, right? That doesn't count necessarily because it's the quality of, of that data as well. And I think that's a big missing aspect. I mean, you can have a, a few data sources that you know really, really well and ultimately be more effective than having an entire load of data sources that you don't know at all, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sort of extending that, so 
thumbs up on all those points, right? And so I, I also look at it as like, you know, maybe at a different, different perspective. And I sort of view this as um, the ability for SOC teams to understand the known unknowns and have to deal with the unknown knowns. And what I mean by that is uh, the known unknowns are such things as, as um, you know, you have visibility you know, across your attack surface and you're pulling in that data. However, because of uh, GDPR and other uh, protections that you have, you know, levels of levels of anonymization, for example, you know, your visibility and understanding what's going on through an organization is purposely restricted, right? Uh, because of, you know, various governance rules and that. And then you have the, um, uh, the unknown knowns, which is worrying about uh, you know the uh, the shadow IT, the you know and the evolution of those technologies and the growth of you know uh, SaaS consumption across the organization, where you know you just don't have the visibility of your uh, you know all the different things that are across your attack surface. However, you are still receiving a rich data stream of logs and other input from you know from the activities that are going around there, and you have to bring back that. Uh, that visibility that you do have of those unknowns and be able to associate that those that visibility from the unknown into something that you can now manage, right? And so I think there are, when I look at that lack of visibility, I think those are, those are the two main buckets that you know, organizations have to figure out how to really tackle, you know? And I think the, the latter one uh, is actually one of the easier ones. The instrumentation that's now being deployed uh, as I think has largely overcome the problem of shadow IT, at least from a SOC team visibility. Now, there's still the policy and you know the enforcement about ensuring that organisations and individual you know, members of those teams, uh, you know, are following following a policy about what you know what service they use. But I think that visibility is growing, and the tools are are now there. The you know the GRC restrictions uh, and uh, on the data that you're allowed to now handle and the, the length of retention. I, I think that is is a new visibility constraints, which uh, many of the SOC teams that I deal with are, are battling and um, they're having to alter their their processes uh, in and their SLAs to the rest of the business about the level of threats that they can respond to. Uh, and uh, from, a, you know, from a regulatory perspective, the types of threats and the duration of those investigations that they can actually genuinely conduct. And I think that there's a new pressures uh, that uh, also you know, maybe seen by the, the SOC teams themselves as, you know, limiting their effectiveness internally, uh, but externally also, you know, the effectiveness of that SOC may be perceived to be less good than uh, the business would hope, but uh, it is out of the hands of those SOC teams. Yeah, I think that raises a really good point. Again, that could lead to misalignment. Management has expectations and they don't understand the uh, the legal or regulatory limitations for what we are able to do, whether we ha it's just through audit logging and monitoring, AI, machine learning. There are certain things that do inhibit our teams from being as effective as they possibly could have been you know, a few years ago before everything started to change with respect to data privacy laws around the world. Moving on to our next slide here, um, one of the things that we asked in our uh, survey was, you know, um, around the effectiveness of our internal SOCs. And you can see it right here, leaders are on a scale of one to 10 are saying five, but staff is putting it at a 3.9. And the reason behind the difference here is that staff feel like they have too many tools and maybe it's a lack of a single pane of glass or it is not being able to operate their tools um, in the manner which would probably produce more activity for them. Um, you know, Gunter, do you have any insight into this from, the, from your experiences um, as a leader and also maybe as um, a SOC analyst from that perspective? Sure, I think that the, the staff view was one of, one of the ones that's probably a little bit easier to understand and that is, uh, for many of the the leaders outside those organisations, they you know they're obviously trying to manage expectations with the rest of the business, you know, and uh, manage to a budget, right? Uh, and so, getting headcount is one of the toughest things for, for most teams, most leaders to sort of you know acquire and to manage and to retain, uh, and you know, compensating factor for you know lack of uh, human resources or skills and talent to to drop into their sock is um, well. You know, 
let's go look in vendor land uh, and look at another product that maybe uh, will help fill some of the gaps that I have on skills or on the people and sort of grow that way. And I think there is uh, just a, there's, there's a misunderstanding then that uh, tools are great. Uh, however, you still need people to manage those tools is one part. Uh, and the second part is that, uh, you know, the glue code and the, if you like, the sweet type approach of being able to take all these different uh, products that are there, um, you know, it may be okay having 20 different products if they all work together uh, and they were all seamlessly connected and data flew, you know, transition, uh, moved from left to right seamlessly. Uh, and, you know, that may be the sales pitch from the, each individual vendor, but the reality is that, you know, the, the staff was inside those teams and found out that that's not really the case, right? Uh, and I think that is also translating to many um, CISOs and organizations really looking at their uh, tooling uh, approach and looking at, you know, suites and sort of bringing these and, and looking at, a, uh, a, you know, reducing the number of vendors and the price they have in that space, I think is a transition that's happening there. Um, but from the leader side, you know, lack of visibility, I, I think uh, that sort of, again, sort of translates down to uh, their interaction with the rest of the business uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, their strength as leaders uh, in selling the security story to the rest of the business and, and finding those uh, and partnering with the stakeholders and the rest of the business such that they, you, that they gain that uh, visibility uh, for their soccer. Yeah. Um any comments from Juliana or Carrig on this point that Gunter made? I would ask, how do you like how when people say when ask somebody how how good or how effective is your SOC? My first question is, how do you know? Right? Because if, the reality is, is, if we're just licking our finger and putting it up in the wind, that's the wrong answer. You know, we can have our assumptions and we can have our feelings about where our SOC is, but this is really why we need to continue to encourage our security organizations to take the validation mechanism and, and validate where they're at. You know, if you think you have a, you have gaps, test it. If you think your SOC is amazing, test it. And by testing it, then you'll know how effective it is and you'll have that evidence behind it to back it up. I think guessing at security questions like this often is far more harm than good because it starts spreading. It gives wrong impressions at times and often is frankly just wrong because we haven't taken the time to look at the data. Yeah, to, I mean, to piggyback off that, I've seen, um, in my experience, tabletop exercises uh, go a long way, and they, they really are helpful in um, assessing the effectiveness of the SOC and making improvements. Um, always lessons to be learned when, when those exercises happen. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Coming from the, the GRC hat that I wear. I love tabletop exercises. <laughs> um, so, so Juliana, I have a question for you on this one, on this slide in particular. Um, which of these do you agree with? Do you agree that it's a lack of visibility defined in however you wanted to define visibility? Or do you think it's too many tools or is it maybe a combination of the two or something else? I mean, I'm, I think it's both. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's gonna be like one or the other. Um, I think in terms of like too many tools, some of that could come also back to the misalignment piece where, um, you know, maybe the organization is too siloed and different teams within InfoSec are off buying different tools that suit their needs, um, but they don't all come together or play well together. Um, and then maybe there are, you know, you know, if there are decisions happening too high up the chain on products uh, without inputs from the staff, then things get missed, requirements get missed. Um, it really takes a solid, um, you know, you really have to have project management in there um, and um, alignment across teams when selecting tools. Because um, you could have two ends of the spectrum. You could have getting vendor happy and going off and buying every best Gartner tool out there, or you could be, okay, we need to save money, um, spend less actually. So there's different sides of the spectrum, but I think um, there needs to be alignment and making sure that that pane of glass is happening. And I know we'll be talking about automation tool too, and I think we're kind of starting to, to bleed into that topic. But um, yeah, I think I think it, it's, it's, it's not one or the other, I'd say it's both. Great, thank you for your input on that one. Um, so what makes working in a SOC so painful? And I think this kind of dovetails right into the rest of the conversation we've been having. Um, in our industry, we all are burned out, I think, since 
the creation of a computer, anyone that works in technology and security has been burned out. <laughs> but this, this statistic here is extremely alarming. 71% say it's an increase in workload is causing their burnout. That is a shocking number of people who are working in a SOC that are struggling. And it ties back into some of the other information we've seen so far in our survey where you know, people want to look for other jobs. They want to leave, which, again, will impact the effectiveness of the SOC if we start losing some of our um, of that knowledge base. 70% are saying that it's information overload, and then 67% say it's a lack of visibility. Um, so, you know, what can be done here? Do, do any of you have any suggestions for not just management and saying, oh, give unlimited PTO or, you know, let them take a half a day here and there, but to really get to the root cause of, of some of this, um, this strife that we're seeing through this survey? Um, I guess, you know, uh, Kara, you can start with you on that one. So I know it sounds cliche, but I'm a really big believer in automation where possible, automation orchestration. You know, at Block, we built a dedicated SOAR team, for example. And the reason is that, to your point, it really sucks having a job where you're doing the same mundane minutia all day, every day and not spending your time doing what you want. I mean, people join security, they want to go find the puzzles, they want to go find the bad guys. They don't want to deal with 200, 300, 500 false positives that they have to scan through each day. And you know, and then we face alert fatigue and other challenges because it ends up being frustrating, right? You, as an analyst, you want to go find stuff. You don't want to deal with the, the mundane BS that you see every single day in some of these platforms. And so I really think as, as the technology improves and as we really modernize our socks to really be able to automate away a lot of that mundane stuff, you know, Hey, we know this is a false positive. Every time it comes up, let's automate that away. Hey, we know how to answer, you know, this alert that says, uh, you know, this guy clicked a phishing link. Let's go automate the password reset, whatever those kinds of things are, right? Whatever we can automate is going to really allow additional time for the analysts to do what they actually like doing. Because when they're having a when they're having a good time, analysts are, are pretty unstoppable in finding what they're looking for. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. Um, and I think that the I think the first two bullets are very closely related. And I think the key point that you brought, up, Eric, is dedicated team. Um, I kind of referenced it earlier, but I think that you know if we have too many people wearing too many hats in a sock, that can also cause burnout. So if you have the same person that's um, in charge and trying to make improvements and make things easier for the analysts and apply automation. Also being um, a level two analyst constantly getting escalations from level one analysts, then they're gonna have a hard time actually making progress. So I think like protecting the ops side of the house and the people that are trying to make improvements in the SOC needs to be um, you know distinct and dedicated, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. And before we move on to um, the next slide, um, to talk about some of this this pain alleviation, that sounds like a commercial for Tylenol. Um, I wanted to actually ask you, Juliana. Um, this is it's you know Women's Month this month, um, and I, I feel that um, working in security, but working in a SOC in particular, can be very difficult for women for a variety of reasons. So when if you put on your strictly just your your hat representing women. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on these numbers here? Is this something that, are, would these numbers, if we'd only surveyed women, be higher, be lower? You know, really, what what um, what perspective do you have to offer there as, as, um, as a woman in this field? Um, I think it, I think it depends. I think they could be slightly higher. Uh, in general, uh, from a woman's perspective, you know, when I first joined a security group um, in my career, it was intimidating. Um, I was actually even told, oh, you're going to need to have thick skin if you're going to that team. <laughs> uh, I was the first girl to rotate in the team of this program I was a part of previously. And um, that being said, I think it's about, um, you know, the inclusion. It comes to the inclusion, making sure you're being inclusive um, and making sure that you're being empathetic, that it could be a little bit more intimidating for this person joining the team and to um, have that mindset and make sure they're feeling comfortable um, and also not um, boxing them into a certain type of role. So, you know, just because someone joins, um, and this would go for anybody, but someone joins and they 
gravitate or they tend to be good at one thing, but they're interested in another to make sure you're supporting them and saying, okay, like, you know, let's try you there. You can, you know, let's train you up. You can take some training and explore that area too. Um, so yeah, but in terms of burnout, I mean, you definitely, for anybody too, like you got to have your boundaries, right. Um, and, you know, make, making sure your women are advocating for themselves, for their boundaries and that they're not being overworked, just like men though too. And, um, it's all about that balance and, and checking in. And I think recognition can help a lot too, because when people are going out on a limb or they're working an extra shift or um, they spent extra time working on an incident that's going on, um, you know, recognizing that and compensating for it is really important too for, for keeping staff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And that does come right into our um, our topic here on, you know, alleviating the pains that we see across the board. Um, you know, what steps can be taken? Seventy one percent mentioned automation, which I think we we've covered that pretty well here. Um, advanced analytics and and then uh, machine learning, sixty three percent. But the staff's top three here at the bottom. So automation of workflow normalized work schedule. So again, those, those boundaries, I think, uh, Juliana, that you were just hinting towards, is, it's super crucial um, these days, especially when everything seems to be on fire all the time across all industries. Um, oops, sorry, that is my dog, I apologize. Um, and then stress management uh, programs are also viewed as being helpful. Um, is there any input that you have um, or any other suggestions on these things? Sure. Maybe if I jump in here, I, I guess, you know, so, um, so automation workflow and what I sort of see in that leaders top three, and, and frankly, I think where the industry has to go is, uh, um, frankly, the, the actual true implementation of machine learning and artificial intelligence and basically, you know, dealing with that automation. So I, I, I worry very much about the, the manual engineered type approach of automation, you know, and, uh, uh, maintenance of playbooks and, uh, and uh, the orchestration layer. That requires more humans with a slightly different skill set to keep on looking after and maintaining these things. You know, I'm seeing great advancements in machine learning, in particular the artificial intelligence side of you know, self-learning systems, and, and I, I do think that that's you know where the industry is going, not just for dealing with you know the fatigue that's uh, and pain that the SOX teams have, but also, frankly, um, the speed of the threats, the volume of the threat, the speed of the threats increased so much that. Throwing humans into the space is, you know, there are now a speed bump uh, in the organization's ability to respond to threats. So I, I think that, you know, while these are threats, uh, th th these are, um, you know, plans for for teams to uh, alleviate some of the stock analyst pain, I, I think it's going to happen anyway, uh, is one part there. But one part I was going to th throw into this part of, you know, helping on the staff side is um, I have seen tremendous success uh, and increasing success with, um, frankly, because of COVID, uh, remotes working, right? So the ability for those SOC analysts uh, and those SOC teams to, you know, work from home, uh, get a better life balance, uh, but also, you know, if, if anyone has ever done this, you know, work in the SOCs and have had to do the you know, shift three, um, you know, the, the worst possible shift you can do. Uh, but if you do, you know, even if you have to do it those sort of hours, but uh, you can do that from home and sort of manage that process, it, it, it fundamentally changes the stress and the view of how, you know, how those things works. And, and I think that now with the remote working and the growth of remote working, uh, many of those aspirations of uh, follow the sun and, uh, and, you know, having teams, you know, or members distributed around the world, uh, within hands reach of just about every organization today. And so I think that those elements of, you know, machine learning AI to deal with the repetitive pieces, but without having to require, um, another class of, you know, engineer or human to set these things up and maintain and the ability to tap a global workforce, uh, and that can, you know, manage their schedules and their you know, balance of work life better, uh, from remote, from a remote perspective. I think we will we'll see change uh, in this, at least, you know, I'll cross both fingers and my toes uh, that that comes true. Yeah, the stress of working from home and having animals that just flip out when deliveries are, are, are showing up at the wrong time. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important that, you know, we do focus 
a bit more on the mental health aspect of our employees in the SOC and also just in general. I think that, you know, the pandemic has brought along some of the challenges and uncovered some some wider issues across our industry. Um, and and I, I feel that that is something that could be managed um, from the from you know, from executives down in in terms of how there are boundaries that are respected in that um, I saw a comment in here um, in the Q and A box about being on call with no twenty four seven triage um, a stressor that leads to people wanting to leave the organization um, or even the industry as a whole. Uh, so, so Juliana or Carrie, do you have anything that you would like to add? I would say the the. Kind of going back to Gunter's point, the, the global nature of a lot of companies these days allows for a different approach. I mean, different companies have different data requirements for who can work what data, but where possible, we're actually getting into that space where global teams are going to become more feasible, more economical, and frankly, just following the sun model aspect, more convenient in some ways. But I think another point that may be worth looking at from a global perspective is that, you know, in America, we're relatively privileged. Third shift sounds terrible. But in a lot of the lower economy company, countries that U.S. companies or Western countries are using to expand their IT forces, be it Mexico or Serbia or India or Southeast Asia, their third shift is usually in those countries presented a, an additional bonus to work it. So, frankly, when, you know, when I had staff in India at h and Block, it was the opposite. They were uh, the people who were on third shift didn't want to leave it because they were getting paid extra money for it and and they wanted to be on that so i think it's important to recognize and have the context of of the global org and the fact that we really can't judge the entire org based on the culture and that doesn't go just globally that's even within the u.s um different parts of the country have very different work-life balance approaches and, and what they value based on where in the you know if you're san, san francisco downtown tech hub it's going to be very different than the guy working from home in the country somewhere with a farm, right? Yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Juliana. <laughs> no, I think that's a great point out too. Like that, there's definitely global market things to consider as well. Um, I think business continuity can help a lot as well. So having a plan for um, when a geolog if a certain geography all of a sudden the market for cyber is nuts and everyone's getting double the pay if they leave that you know you have a plan in place um, to make sure that there's continuity there that um, it's you know making it as easy as possible for new joiners to get onboarded quickly um, spending some time in those things and getting new joiners perspectives on how well uh, onboarding when uh, can go a long way with um, alleviating big changes like that that can and like will happen in different geographies um, and to speak to like the automation piece and machine learning piece I think one thing to be careful of in this that could end up leading to fatigue is implementing these things um, you know the industry is going in the right direction the tools are getting better but um, with machine learning, for example, a lot of noise can come from machine learning in our EDR and AV tools. And it requires tuning. It requires those dedicated resources to really understand what's going on. And depending on your business behavior, they could be even more than maybe at different companies. So if your business behaves a certain way that really triggers a lot of machine learning type incidents, you could even have more fatigue and noise. Um, and with automation, it can feel overwhelming to, to get things done. but you know, sometimes you don't need to bite off that much. Sometimes you just need to do one small piece of the fishing process and analysts are more happy. Um, so, you know, just kind of narrowing that focus and automation and, and understanding again, that a lot of it also depends on other IT groups too and their ability. Um, piggybacking off of IT, if they have a really solid process or their own automation and it fits a use case for security, you know, piggybacking and plugging in, um, that could be helpful too. So. Uh, yeah, just some things to consider. And I see we have another question. Um, what can we do to help with the mental well-being of our analysts? I mean, does it truly come down to just listening to them since they're the ones that are boots on ground that are working every day and seeing some of these struggles? Could it be as simple as that? Or perhaps maybe having a separate um, resource group that could be set up in your organization to support them? Um, I'll leave that to the Gunter and to, to Karig as the leaders here for your perspective. I can, I guess I can go first. The, 
I think one of the key aspects on, on mental well-being is a, is a culture of transparency. I think I've been in some organizations where there's there's an expectation that if you're the soldier on the ground, basically, that you put up with more stuff or that there's a less than ideal environment when it comes to speaking up the chain. I think this is really where cultivating a kind of a community culture where people are encouraged to speak up and to discuss here's the challenges that we're facing, not necessarily on, even on the personal front, but just having the openness and willingness in the, in the climate where your staff is willing to speak up and, and have those conversations. One of the things that I do that I've seen more and more people doing are skip levels with every single person under my umbrella, not because I want to know what they're doing for their job. I just want to know how they are. And it's amazing how much that can change a culture, even if it's just quarterly, just having a touch point with the people on your team. Some don't really want to get into things, and that's cool. Some, you'll learn things you never expected that'll cause you to ask questions and, and help you better understand how the organization is running. As long as you are willing to have an open mind and, and hear that feedback and hear the, the comments, and not necessarily with the you know with being defensive and other stuff because you really want to encourage that within the team not necessarily to complain per se just to have a, a culture where it's open and people are comfortable talking regardless of who's on who's on the call or the video or, or the meeting room so i i sort of you know i'd add to that right i think that uh, having that culture of being able to communicate you know and be able to uh you know a little venting uh, that sort of goes into that process, but be able to have that clear communication channels goes a long, long way for you know, uh, managing the, the stresses of the job. But I, I would add one that, you know, from my own personal experience and you know, running these teams has been uh, in a high stress, high workload uh, SOC team, one of the first things that gets sacrificed uh, is team training and education. Right, uh, and uh, I think uh, it behoves uh, those leaders of those teams to really, really ring fence that uh, education, that learning piece there uh, for, for two reasons. So one is um, <clears throat> you want your team to grow, you know, as in their, their capacity, their capabilities, their experience to grow. And if they're <clears throat> doing the same thing day in, day out, there's no room for improvements. Uh, they get bored, stressed, and uh, they leave, they depart. However, you know, the mere fact of uh, you know, wait, the opportunity for many analysts to uh, go to Black Hat DEF CON for five days to learn new things, meet with uh, peers to uh, broaden their networks uh, is uh, phenomenal to watch when those, those members come back, right, with the new learnings, new, new skill sets, uh, and new uh, alliances that they formed uh, during that time. So, so again, I, I, I'll roll back many times on uh, that education piece in particular, being able to move from here is a, a video education that you should do online out of hours uh, of your SOC, your SOC job to uh, physically going to attend a conference or you know, a SANS course for a number of days um, a phenomenal turnarounds, you know, and you know, the the mental well being of those those teams, the the individuals there, uh, is the best thing, the best shot in the arm that I can ever think of. Yep, absolutely, I agree with that. And lastly, here, you know, do you have a sock success story? or story of misalignment, perhaps uh, Juliana, you know, is there uh, an experience that you've had where, you know, you've made your needs or your team's needs known um, and management either responded or didn't respond and had an impact on this, on, on this topic on SOC misalignment? Yeah, I think um, it kind of speaks to the retention too, but um, I found um, success in having a path for analysts to go. So, um, you know, as Gunter mentioned, like analysts are going to get bored. Um, they want to be trained. They want to do something new. And in order to um, be able to navigate that, they need to see the different directions they can go. Um, and to do that, you kind of have to make sure that, you know, your staff isn't wearing all the hats, that there's you know, dedicated functions within your stock. Someone, a group that focuses on threat intelligence, a group that focuses on content management and building rules, a team that func functions on, um, sorry, focuses on threat hunting and um, advanced analytics. So 
uh, having those different groups gives um, gives the team a, a somewhere to look forward to, points of contact to talk to about what they're doing in their function and learn and shadow. Um, so I, I've seen that as a great success in, in the socks I've been in um, to have those types of groups and, and things to look forward to. And um, yeah, so and, and it was something that um, also in the past has been brought up and um, leadership listened and, and they helped grow those things. So um, I think that's a big, big piece. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the the boredom and the, the overwork is something that I think is felt across our our industry. Um, security is is definitely one of those places where people want to get involved. They want to get their hands dirty and learn new things. And being able to provide them with career pathing and, and development, both personally and professionally, does go a long way in keeping people um, interested and making them want to stay with your organization. Um, Karen, is there any um, success story that you could share with us? Any experiences you have there? Well, I, yeah, actually, I mean, I've really been blessed in this space to have participated in a, a couple of SOC builds. And, you know, when you have the leadership support and you have a team that's willing to, to be creative, you can have a lot of fun with it. And I think that's the key to having that success story is to make it interesting. I think to Juliana's point, one of the big challenges is you come into some of these organizations and, you know, probably when I went to Block is probably one of the good examples when I was brought in there to, to rebuild the operations side of the house was really, we had a lot of people that were all doing the same types of stuff, right? There was really not a lot of organization or alignment and, and a jack of all trades, master of none concept is truly real, right? And, and at the same time, if you're doing everything, if, if in your mind, your responsibility is to do everything, then that leads to more burnout. It leads to other stuff because even if you get done with your work for the day, well, now there's more stuff to do. So I think coming in and creating an organization where you have different verticals, to Juliana's point, you have dedicated SOAR, you have a dedicated instant response and advanced analytics that are different, right? Different focuses where you have, we have what we call our advanced, uh, our adversary modeling and intelligence team, right? Our AMI team, where we have cyber threat intel. We have a red team that's not being asked just to do your basic pen testing, but that's actually given the freedom to go, hey, go pretend you're the adversary and, and test us, right? Let's, let's validate where we're at. Because when you have different verticals like that, the other thing it gives you from a SOC success perspective is a development path for the new folks you bring in. Now, all of a sudden, you can bring in folks who don't necessarily have your traditional experience. You might bring a different career background, a different experience a different something right a different viewpoint because really that's what we're looking for is ideas and the more diverse our people the more diverse the ideas and the and the thoughts that they bring to the discussion and then you can get you have a, you have a development path people are excited to come in you have a, a wide range of people from different expertise levels to help mentor in and, and guide that path and they they're not they're, they're not siloed they're not pigeonholed into hey you're going to be an instant response on this forever right if you as you mature, as you grow, go try out threat intelligence, see what you think. You know, Block was really good about switching people around. Hey, go to GRC for a few months, come back. Go to SecOps for a few months, come back. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes people are like, I don't wanna go there. And then they end up loving it because it's completely different. I mean, people have this concept in their mind that cybersecurity is one job, but it's not. And I think the key to having that SOC success story is to maximize the within the team, the understanding and the alignment that this is a whole bunch of different roles so that people don't get bored. So people have an opportunity to go learn a whole bunch of stuff, even if they're not necessarily being promoted from a, you know, I guess title perspective, they still get to grow and learn and, and become more competitive for future opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I should be saying like, amen to, <laughs> to all those <laughs> comments there. Um, yeah, I, I would add another sort of, uh, view on this, and that is, you know, as a security industry, we have matured an awful lot. And I think there are like two paradigms that have, we've now understood and we've, we realized. So one is, you know, assume breach, right? So we now realize that this stuff is always going on. And so let's be in a ready mode. And the second one is that uh, temporary fixes are always permanent. Right, uh, and you know, and the security hat. When I look at that, is SOC teams. You know, if they're feeling the stress, that uh, they're always busy and they're always reacting. Um, don't dangle this, you know, carrot at the front. And say it'll be all right eventually. Um, that's not the way that you should do. Again, you know, 
go into the story and the success in the story is um, the busyness is not going to go away. And so build and resource and train, you know, and plan, you know, those educational breaks, those career breaks, those career movements into the plan and do not, you know, do not try to assume that at some point things are going to get easier or there's going to be, you know, a quieter time and just, you know, it just become you have to operate your sockets there in the, you know, that, that heavy load is going to be continuous. Uh, and so you have to manage your teams and resources around uh, and, and, and force the force time for those uh, career training, et cetera, et cetera, into your plans. Right. And if you do that, then you have successful SOC teams, you have uh, successful SOC analysts, uh, and frankly, you retain the teams uh, and uh, increase the morale of the teams. Yeah, and I think that ties back again into Juliana's point of having boundaries and not only respecting your own personal boundaries, but management respecting them as well and giving you the opportunities to, to continue to develop personally and professionally. So we've reached the end of our webinar and I would love to open it up to any other questions that anybody has. You know, just a reminder, you can pop your questions right into the Q&A box. We've got about four minutes. I think we had some really great discussion and hopefully that was um, you know, beneficial for everybody that was able to join us today. Do not see any other questions coming in. I'll just give it a few more seconds here, just in case someone's typing something wrong. Okay. All right, well, thank you all for attending today's webinar um, on SOC misalignment. Uh, if you wanna learn more, you can see right here, you can download our report at devo.com. You can just search for the 2021 Devo SOC Performance Report. Thank you all so much for your time. And uh, we look, oh, actually a question just popped up. What are the best ways to educate analysts? SANS courses are mentioned. Are there any others that you would recommend? So I'm actually okay. probably not the normal person when it comes to cybersecurity in this space. I think SANS courses are super high quality, but I think they're also cost prohibitive to a lot of folks coming into the industry. There are so many new and up and coming organizations offering far, I guess, less expensive courses to learn and to participate in. And I would really encourage anybody who's interested to really get involved in the Twitter scene for InfoSec, to get involved in LinkedIn for InfoSec. There's a lot of really good resources available. I mean, TCM Security has kind of come out of nowhere in the last year or so and offered a lot of courses for very inexpensive prices that are super high quality. And we're seeing more and more of that. So SANS, I think historically was the, the leader, the, the best of class when it came to the training and I'm not going to say that they aren't still in some ways, but when it comes to analysts wanting to grow, don't pigeonhole yourself into courses that are that expensive. There's a lot of resources out there right now. Sure, and yeah. I, I would sort of add to that, you know, there are a lot of local and regional get togethers of teams, right? And mm, so that, that peer network is especially important uh, for, for SOC analysts or any, any security uh, uh, persons uh, to sort of build and grow that sort of network. Uh, I think it's probably the, the primary one there. You know, the other one that I, you know, I, I personally find a great benefit from, you know, and sitting a little bit on the, on the cost side there is, the, the Black Hat conferences uh, and the DEF CON conferences and, and that scene there have been you know, very fruitful for building and growing those networks and uh, finding like-minded peers and being able to share stories, tactics, you know, and uh, a shoulder to cry on sometimes uh, when investigating a particular threat. Yeah, and just to add in the last minute here, um, as you're bringing in new tools, utilize training credits. Make sure that your teams are getting trained on the tool by the people who are selling it to you. Uh, I think that will really go a long way to alleviate some of that um, technology fatigue if folks are being trained on how to use a tool right after it's being purchased. I think that, that also goes a really long way as well, in addition to having some of these um, outstanding security trainings and forums that are available. Um, right, so uh, I think that's all. Juliana, unless you have something to add. 
Uh, no, I was just going to say like anything that's hands-on. Um, there's a lot of better trainings where they provide a lab too, virtually. Um, and I think that go like really improve over the past couple of years. So definitely where they can like do a training and then also jump in a lab is, is the best, I think. Perfect. Thank you for adding that. Um, all right. Well, thank you all. Please head over to Devo.com and check out our Devo Stock Performance Report. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be willing to uh, have a conversation. So thank you all very much for your time today. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care. And thank you to all of our panelists as well. Cool. And uh, thank you, Kayla, for being the excellent host. <laughs> thank you. That was awesome. That was great. Thank you. <laughs>